Okay. Any announcement or shall I announce myself? Or? Okay. I will now introduce the head monk who will now introduce me. In the triple gym blessing all. Good evening, most venerable Mahasangha. Today, we are very fortunate to have most venerable Ajahn Ram here at Thames Buddhist Vihara. On behalf of our resident monks and all the devotees, I respectfully and warmly welcome most venerable Ajahn Brahm for this special Dharma talk. And also I kindly welcome Vikkuna Chanda. And uh, also I welcome you all for this program. And we are very pleased to have Bhante here today. And uh, I respectfully invite Bhante to deliver the Dharma sermon. Uh, everyone say Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. But I, underst I understand we'll begin with uh, maybe 20 minutes meditation. Is that okay? Okay, do you want a guided meditation or just be peaceful? I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> okay, let's do a guided meditation. If I do guided meditation, I usually just guide for the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and then I'm quiet to let your mind carry on and be peaceful, because there's nothing more beautiful than peace in the mind. So first of all, uh, you can sit down. Please turn off your mobile device, devices so it doesn't make any noise. But I'm quite happy to record anything which I say here this evening. I've got nothing to hide or nothing to uh, make secret. It's a nice thing which the Buddha said. He always taught with an open fist, never a closed fist, never keeping anything secret. So anyway, uh, first of all, just to close your eyes. It's much easier meditating when you cut off the sense of sight. and then cutting off the sense of hearing. You know, we try and keep an ambient sound in the room so there's no big disturbance. This Vihara is in a pretty good location. It's not noisy traffic. It's not uh, a noisy place at all. So after a while the sense of sound can disappear. And smell and taste can disappear. And it's a feeling in the body, the sense of touch, is one of the hardest of senses to calm down. And one reason for that is that we don't make certain that our posture is suitable you know, for the purposes of meditation. There's only a 20 minute meditation, but we want to make sure that we use it to the best of our ability. So first of all, make sure you're sitting comfortably. This is what I call the combination of mindfulness and kindness. Together it becomes kindfulness. And we start on our body, kayagata sati. Being kindful to our body. So you ask yourself, how are my legs right now? How do they feel? I've been sitting cross-legged on the floor for years and years and years, even before I became a monk. So my legs are very happy like this. But if they weren't, I would suggest sitting on a chair, sitting on a stool, sitting with cushions, I've often thought <coughs> of manufacturing state-of-the-art meditation cushions with different compartments 
and you have a remote control and can fill the different compartments with <coughs> air. So if your bottom needs to be raised a bit, you press one button and it fills with air in the back and lifts you up. If it's the knees which need lifting up, they can lift up. If you need a little bit of massage on your butt, it can massage you. And if you suffer from sloth and torpor, you can press another button and you get a latte coming out from the side. <laughs> I'm surprised no one's done that yet. Anyway, <clears throat> so we haven't got that here, but just check your legs and adjust them if you need to. Just the very fact that you care means your legs can actually relax. I've done this so many years now. I know my knees, I know my thighs, I know my buttocks. And you can tell when they're comfortable and when they're not. And I know my chest area. You know when the, uh, <coughs> the digestive system is somehow ill. And I've done this quite a few times. I wouldn't say it if I didn't know it works. You can focus on something in your digestive tract. If it's just a acute problem, nothing which has been long lasting, you may have eaten some food which wasn't well cleaned or something, have a bit of indigestion. And you can feel that in your digestive tract. And just being with that feeling, being kind to it, it can relax it. All the muscles around that area can loosen up. And any food stuck in there, any gas, it can be released. It's wonderful you can do that without having to take medications. Or you may look at your chest area. And I do help and deal with many people who have cancers. And if breast cancer is a, a nasty thing which women have to suffer, and there is a way to avoid most of that breast cancers. And that's if you feel that something in that part of your body is tense, tight, aching, painful, not normal. Then you can put your attention there, just give it lots and lots of kindness. And you discover what kindness is. If it tenses up, that's not kindness. If it loosens up, that becomes the kindness. As it loosens up, energies can go to that part of the body which are usually blocked off. And the whole thing becomes so much more healthy and easy. So you're learning it now just to relax the body for the purpose of meditation. But it has all these amazing benefits afterwards. And then you relax your shoulders. And if you relax your shoulders, first of all, try doing the opposite. Scrunch them up. Once they're scrunched up, then you let go. You stop pulling and pushing and scrunching and squashing. And your shoulders go to their natural position. This is what letting go means. Something in your life is scrunched up through pushing and pulling and squashing and trying to get rid of things. Letting go means you don't do that anymore. And you can feel, just like your shoulders relax, you can feel your life is more relaxing. And then your, your arms and your hands, how do they feel? because I'm holding a microphone, I can't put my hands together. But I'm used to this now, I know how to hold a microphone for half an hour and just relax everything. And lastly I go to my head. 
I usually as I'm doing now, it feels a bit tight and tense. So I'm going to move my head this way and that way until I find the optimum position to put my head on top of the neck. That's how much I care for it. And then lastly, I'm aware of the muscles around my eyes, my nose, my mouth. Once you have awareness of those feelings around your face, <coughs> then you learn how to relax those feelings. How do you do it? A lot of trial and error to begin with. But then you get feedback from mindfulness. You can feel them change. Everything gets more relaxed around the eyes and the mouth and the nose. And with that, many disturbing negative emotions get taken away. You do become more relaxed. And then, once the body is relaxed enough, if it's a longer meditation, I ask people to see if you can notice the delight of meditation. It's like a pleasure of your body. Everything is so loose, and relaxed and at peace. When I pick up this special feeling of delight of sukha, I notice the relaxation goes even deeper. So when I start my meditation, my body is really relaxed. And it feels pleasurable. I enjoy meditation. And then, I enjoy that for a few moments. And then I go into the mind. How do I go into the mind, the realm of the mental faculties? First of all, see, how do I feel right now? Right now. If you're being kind to your body, you stay with the bodily feelings for a while, you're in this present moment. You don't need to be disturbed by the past or the future. You've only got a short time, you can leave that until later on. Procrastination is sometimes very helpful. So don't figure out the past until later. No need to figure out the later and that it's happened. Just keep it simple. How does it feel to be now? What is happening right now? It becomes one of the beautiful meditation objects. The training in what I've called the Emperor's Three Questions. Now are the most important time. What you're aware of right now has to be right now. It's the only thing to be aware of. It's the most important. And lastly, the only thing to do is to care for it. Open the door of your heart to this moment. And you find if it's something negative, that kindness will release that negative negativity with this moment becomes easy to be present because it's pleasant. From the present moment awareness, see if you can go deeper into silence. There's no need to describe anything. No need to plan what you're going to do next. We're supposed to be in this moment. No need for any guilt or ill will or feelings of failure. That's all to do with the past. We let that all go. All we have is now. Be silent. Really silent.
and the mind becomes peaceful quite naturally. You'll soon be able to observe your breathing. It comes to you. You don't need to search for it. Just be patient in this moment. Silent. I'll be quiet for a few minutes.
So how do you feel? How relaxed is your body? How peaceful is your mind? And now after the three more breaths, you may open your eyes to end the meditation. After three more breaths, And after three more breaths, please remember to carry on breathing. <coughs> so anyway, please excuse me if the meditation was short, only 20 minutes. That was on purpose because I am still jet lagged. I only came in from Australia yesterday afternoon <coughs> after a very busy Katina day, after fighting, not fires, but people are supposed to be protecting us for fires which didn't exist, and <coughs> lots of hard work. <laughs> it's over in Australia. But anyhow, I'm here now, so let's talk about the title of the talk is, what was it again? Non self and responsibility. Non self and responsibility. And you're not supposed to be responsible. Not for that title. Not for that title. Indeed. So the person who made up that title was Venerable Chanda, so she's responsible for it. So if I make a terrible job of this, please don't blame me. You can blame her. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Yes, I know, but you're supposed to follow the teacher, whether he's right or wrong. <coughs> so anyhow, uh, can you hear okay? Yes? Okay. So one of the uh, stories to start off with, and just to get me just going, uh, somebody reminded me of one of these stories. I've got to be very careful because many of you are here because you've heard these stories on YouTube. Is that correct? Yes. So you know all the stories and all the jokes and all the anecdotes. But there's one of those stories about non-self, which I thought was amusing, but true. It's how being a monk or a nun, sometimes you aren't responsible. So that was a story where over in Australia, I was told that because I'm an old monk now, that, you know how old I am? I am 903. 903, I can't lie. I've got to keep the right precepts like everybody else. So 903, that's my age. How can that be, you think, when I was born in 1951? <laughs> Months old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 903 months. 72 years, but 903 months. Which is more impressive? <laughs> but anyhow, um, I found out that I qualified for an Australian Commonwealth health care card because you're old. I don't know why they make it free because the more old you are, the more you, you cost the government. <laughs> Sensible government should make it only free health care for young people. Anyhow, to be able to get that health care card, I just went, in, went online. That should be easy enough. But they said, no, you have to come in and get interviewed. Why? Because there's a lot of identity fraud these days. And that's really interesting. For those of you who understand non-self, you shouldn't be really concerned with the identity fraud. It's not my identity anyway. If somebody wants to take it, fine. And you'll have to come up here and do all the talks. 
Is that a good idea? <laughs> Who would like to be Ajahn Brahm? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know me too well. You know what Ajahn Brahm means? It's not a Thai name, is it? It's not a Sri Lankan name. The full name is Bra Brahma Wangso. But I told you earlier on why it is called Brahma. It's a shortened version. Why is that? The two little girls at the back. B for? Oh, they're really, yeah. B for Buddhist, R for Roman Catholic, A for Anglican, H for Hindu, M for Muslim. I thought that would make some sort of gesture to create harmony in this world. And I was just uh, this afternoon visiting an old friend from Cambridge and we were just uh, talking uh, about the story of this Buddhist monk, Christian priest and Jewish rabbi. And they met together and they wanted to try and sort of work together to sow some peace and harmony between uh, three different religions. And so they, first of all, they just started having afternoon tea together, but then no, that didn't really lead to any just deep understanding of each other and their religions. So the one thing led to another, and they just started to have, play some little games together. They started like playing cards together. And to make it more interesting, they put you know, a few pounds on each game. And then somebody let on that this was illegal in the place they were playing cards together. That was gambling. So because the police found out about this, the three of them had to go to court in front of a judge. And the judge saw these three sort of holy people, leaders of their particular religions, you know, playing cards together. That was a charge. So the judge asked them, so look, be straight. First of all, the Christian, where are you gambling? And as quick as anything, this priest looked up into heaven and said, Jesus, forgive me. Much faster than that. <coughs> the judge never caught it. So he said, and he said, no, I wasn't gambling. So, okay, you can go. He let off. And then the Jewish rabbi, were you gambling? What he did, he put his hands behind his back and crossed his fingers. Did you ever do that when you were young? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, he said no too after crossing his fingers. And the judge was getting suspicious now. So the judge asked the Buddhist monk, now keep your hands in front of you. You, know, you can't ask Buddha to forgive you. Breaking the precepts. Were you lying? Were you gambling? And the Buddhist monk said, Gambling? With whom? <laughs> <laughs> and that's how the Buddhist got off. <laughs> Wisdom power. <laughs> Have you heard that one before? Oh, good. <laughs> You're very kind. But anyhow, the particular story I, w I wanted to tell about not self was, you know, when I applied for one of these um, Commonwealth healthcare cards, they wanted to make sure I wasn't trying to have any identity fraud, because you know, many people try and take you know, easy options; they get financial benefits of pre-healthcare by pretending to be someone they're not. So they said, "Please come in for an interview." So I came in for one of these interviews in his social service department. I couldn't choose who was going to interview me. It was this, this elderly lady, you know, senior member of the healthcare department. And she said, can you prove who you are? And my response was, I've been a Buddhist monk almost 50 years. For 50 years I've been trying to find out who I am. And you asked me to say that straight away, I said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you laughed, she didn't. <laughs> Is it the same in, in the UK, that people in these government departments don't have a sense of humour? 
<laughs> but anyhow, then they asked me for, well, ID, can we see some identification? Can we see your driver's license? I don't have a driver's license, I'm a forest monk. He said, okay, can we see your credit card? I don't have a credit card. Can we see your bank account details? I don't have a bank account. Well, how do you live? Very comfortably. <laughs> Whatever ID have you got? Have you got your um, marriage certificate? <laughs> so I'm not married. Have you got your, uh, what else do I have? Like your uh, house certificates? I don't have a house. Your rental agreement. I don't have a rental agreement. Or the other thing they did ask, oh, that's already said that marriage certificate. I don't have anything like that. All the things which identify you in this world, I didn't have. This is a true part of the story. This is not just a joke, it's just a funny event which happened a couple of years ago. And they said, if you don't have anything like this, according to the Australian government, you don't exist. And I replied, yes, the Buddha was right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, being a monk, being a bhikkhu, so a lot of the things which identify you in the world, you just don't have. And that's kind of cute. I'm not quite sure about you, I'm not political, but I do like to frustrate government departments <laughs> sometimes. Just like when you go through the customs and immigration at airports. This is my baggage. This is all I have. So when I travel through the airport, this is all I have. So they said, where's the rest of your baggage, sir? I said, this is it. And they, they say, why? Because I'm a Buddhist monk. And in the teachings, you always hear the Buddha said, monks, you should travel with just your bowl and robe and a few other possessions, just like the birds fly through the sky. Have you seen birds flying through the sky? Have you ever seen a bird with a backpack on? <laughs> and they travel from country to country, from continent to continent. They don't have any baggage. So you should be like a bird. <laughs> but they still ask, well, what have you got inside your bag, sir? And so I said, first of all, just nothing, just the ordinary stuff which uh, you need to you know, brush your teeth. And they said, oh, yes, toothpaste and gels, because you have to declare those. So they asked, and I, said, I already showed him my toothpaste. They said, what about the hair gel? Glad <laughs> 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 he asked me that. And then I said, hair gel? And then I started laughing, he started laughing, his friends started laughing, and then they let me through. Sometimes when you have a sense of humour, you know, people like to laugh. It makes people friendly towards you. So anyway, so often in life, aren't you just uh, with names and stuff? This is a story. I, I'm, I love to tell these stories, especially in my first talk, to make it... Uh, Interesting. What is my name in Sri Lanka? What do the books call me? The Smiling White Monk. <laughs> <laughs> is that true? Yes, <laughs> that's my nickname there. And that's, that's true because in order to make these teachings interesting, we always add that humour and that happiness so people can smile. So that's also one of the reasons why, to keep myself fit and healthy, I always do 10 push-ups in the morning. I do. <laughs> one, two, <laughs> three, in front of the mirror. That creates this happy mind and happy face. And when I did that as a student for three years, I said two years without missing one morning, I'd always begin the morning laughing. Laughing at this stupid monk or stupid young man smiling at himself in the mirror. If there's any psychologist here or counsellors, that's a beautiful way, very simple, 
to create more happiness in your life. To be able to smile at yourself in the morning and laugh at this silly face of this young man smiling at himself in the mirror. When you start with a happy mind, it becomes much more energetic. It's one of the things which I learned as a monk, sorry, as a, as a student. One of the stupid things I did as a young student was I joined the boat club in Cambridge. You know, the rowing on a river. I never got far in that because I, I just got, I haven't got a competitive boat inside of me. If somebody wants to do better, I, I did see the poor Sri Lankan cricket team didn't do very well in the World Cup. <coughs> I had to look at that, for those of you who don't know, it was about five months ago, about five months ago, you know, Sanat Jayasuriya, you know, the famous batsman in Sri Lanka, came to see me. He wanted a bit of help. So I gave him some blessings, some holy string, and they did terribly. <laughs> So <laughs> they don't need to bother me anymore. The last time I did that, I think you all know that story. The last time they did that, that they were playing Australia in a one-day match many years ago, and they were doing terribly at lunchtime. So they sent some Sri Lankan boys to see me to get some of the holy pirate thread. So I know cricket, so I gave them 12 pieces you know, pirate thread for their wrist. No, 11 for the, the players and one for the 12th man. And I forgot about it afterwards until later on that year, Sri Lanka beat Australia in the final of the World Cup. The Australians were very upset. The Sri Lankans were so happy. And when the captain, remember Arjuna Ranatunga? He held up the World Cup. I saw it on the front page of the Australian newspaper. He had my string on his wrist. <laughs> and I kept it quiet for many years. If the Australian government found out, they would have found some way <laughs> to take away my passport, send me somewhere else. And so it worked that time, but he came back again to ask for some more string. This time it didn't work. <laughs> I was very lucky. And I know why it didn't work. Because at last, the, the uh, Sri Lankan cricket team, at last, they're Buddhists. As a Buddhist, the worst thing you ever want to do is cause upset to anybody else. You're kind, you're compassionate. So you don't want to, to hurt India by beating them. And I'm sure many in the Australian cricket team, they made sure they didn't bowl so fast or do too many leg spin, because that would really disappoint the opposition. And they, threw the, they threw up a nice, threw easy uh, balls to hit to the boundaries out of kindness. And sometimes when the, the batsmen from the other team, they hit the ball in their direction, what did the Sri Lankan Buddhist our fielders do, they let it go. <laughs> they were being Buddhist. <laughs> That's why <laughs> Buddhist sportsmen never win anything. <laughs> anyway, so how do I get... You were the... rowing along the river. Buried? You were rowing. I'm rowing along the river, yes, another sport. So I, I never really wanted to win anything. But also, one thing I did do there, I learned a very wonderful lesson. When the coach, I don't know if you've seen any of these you know, races along the river, they always have a coach, usually on a bicycle with a megaphone, shouting at you. And he was shouting at me, saying my lane name before I became a monk was Peter. He said, Peter, you're making an ugly face. You look terrible. Smile. And first of all, I could understand I was making an ugly face. That oar was really hard to pull. I'd been pulling it for so long, I was exhausted in a race. But he shouted out, smile. And one of the things which I did at my young age, I was always 
prepared to experiment and try something new. So I did smile. And what I found out was the ore was easier to pour. It never hurt that much. And a lot of time I realized that in sport or in life, if you're having an operation or you ladies giving birth, sometimes you make it more painful. You make it more hurtful by not smiling enough, not having a positive attitude towards it. You're going through some operation and sometimes the, the doctor says this is very painful. When you're going through that operation, if it's uh, not anesthetized, please smile while the doctor's doing his thing. It hurts less. You relax more. You don't tense up so much. It's easy what, even when you kids, you're doing O levels or A levels. Why can't you smile when you're doing that exam? You will always do much better. Simple teachings, but I thought that was really brilliant. That was the best thing which I learned from like rowing. I got out of it as soon as I could because I was not competitive. And you know, I'm going off topic here as usual. But how many of you know the sport, the only sport where I represented Cambridge against Oxford? Do any of you know? Some of you must know. Yes? No. no. What was that road? Bowling. Bowling, no. <laughs> what does it begin with? Begins with a T. <laughs> tennis? No. <laughs> I love playing tennis for fun, but not as a sport and a competition. The only sport I thought was useful, yes? No, that's not a sport. <laughs> And that's hard work. You ask any one of your teachers, what was that story? I think I told you that story this, as I came in about the mother who couldn't wake up her son in the morning. Have you got any children like that? Hard to wake them up in the morning to go to school? <laughs> Very good. Now you haven't got any children, you two at the back. <laughs> you are done. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, the, the mother went to her son's bedroom and said, Son, you've got to get up. It's time to go to school. And the son said, Mommy, I don't like going to school. But son, you have to go to school. But Mommy, why should I go to school? None of the teachers like me. None of the other children like me either. Why should I go to school? Because, son... You're the principal, the headmaster. <laughs> I can have them laughing in the back. <laughs> but anyway, uh, where am I going now? Yeah, you got lost too. Oh, the T word. Oh, the T word, yes. It was amazing they had this sport at Cambridge. It was called Tiddlywinks. <laughs> it was a kids' game, we just played it for fun. It was the only, <laughs> it was the only game where, you know, no one could be serious about it. It was just a fun game. And being rebellious against all these games where you had to win. Why do you have to win? If you have any competition, whether it's cricket or tennis or football, how many teams come second? And they feel terrible. They came so close to getting the championship, the cup, and they lose. Most teams in a competition, most countries, whether it's a soccer team or tennis team or whatever, most countries go home disappointed. And only one country comes up top only for a year, and then they have the competition again. They have to do it all over again. When you think about it, there's so much suffering involved when people take winning so seriously. 
So because of that, I saw through sport so early on in my life. I just didn't want to win anything, didn't want to compete. Because I thought it was causing too much suffering for myself and others. Sometimes if you come very close, you just come second. So close, that's really a lot of suffering. Let alone all the suffering from everybody else. You know, once when I was a school teacher, one of the children in my class came bottom of the class. Of course, one has to come bottom. Even if that, those children were special children, advanced children, gifted kids, if there were all 30 kids who would become equivalent to Einstein's in the future, still one has to come bottom. So when I gave out the report cards, I don't like report cards. How can you judge anybody? When you go to school, do you get grades at school? A, B, C, D, E, F. Do you get those? Yeah. Do you know what they mean? <coughs> now, A means arrogant. <laughs> B means bossy. <laughs> E means excellent, and F means fantastic. <laughs> so why is it that we all judge, even at school, we judge who's the winner, who's the loser? Apparently there was a TV program which people said, of course I haven't seen it, The Biggest Loser. And I thought, why is the biggest loser? Why did they use that term? Would you like to be a winner or a loser? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. You've got potential. <laughs> and often I say that being a loser is much more beneficial than being a winner. Think about it. A lot of times, if you have lots and lots of possessions, you have to have lots and lots of security from burglars and stuff, lots of money for insurance. If you live with small things, you don't have to worry about losing your possessions. You've already lost them. <laughs> what about how many of you have kids at home? and they're 30 or 31, 32. They should have left home already, but still they hang out with their parents. So if you can lose your children, they go to another country, got married somewhere, or got a nice job, how many of you can be free? No, hardly any of you. Because I always remember being a forest monk, you see all these um, birds in the forest raising their kids. And they really look after their kids. They're always feeding them with worms and other things. And they, they go very hungry themselves. They protect them, look after them, they train them. And once those birds get trained, what does mummy and daddy do? They kick them out of the nest. Once they can look after themselves. So mummy and daddy can fly to another country. Like how many mummies and daddies would love to fly over to Sri Lanka or fly over to Australia? But they can't because their kids are still at home. Can you do that? Let go? Be a loser instead of a winner? Who is the biggest loser? The biggest loser the Buddha, no possessions, no responsibilities, teaching by example how to lose being judged by how much you own or judged by just how much, how much, how famous you are. Was the Buddha famous? I love some of these stories if you haven't heard them before. Of once there was a monk who was ordained by one of the Buddha's chief disciples in the west coast of India. 
And after having that basic ordination and training, he asked to go and visit the Buddha who was still alive. He hadn't seen him yet. In those days, he had to walk. Walk by stages, many, many days, until he got to the Ganges Valley. And on the way, you sleep wherever you can. The one place he passed was a, uh, a potter's or a workshop. And he asked the owner of the workshop, was it okay if you could just sleep in the workshop because I had straw there overnight, just for one night? And the uh, workshop owner said, yes, no problem, and I can supply a meal for you tomorrow morning. But then an hour or two later, another monk came, and the other monks has asked the workshop owner, can I please stay here as well for one night? workshop owner said, yes, of course, there's, but there's another monk there. So the other monk was kind enough to give permission for the second monk to stay as well. And so because they were monks, then once they settled in, they started meditating. And as they were meditating, the first monk who stayed there was meditating really well, noticed the second monk was also meditating well. And they meditated the whole night. So in the morning, so the monk who came second said, your meditating is really good. It's very impressive. You meditated all night. You know, who's your teacher? And he said, I was ordained and taught by one of these great monks of this teacher called the Buddha. And he trained me and I'm on my way now to see the Buddha. And the second, he asked the second monk who came after him, you, know, you meditate well as well. Who's your teacher? And the second monk said, I don't have a teacher. I am the Buddha. <laughs> and the first monk was, oh, I should have known who you are. I'm terribly sorry. Ask forgiveness. He said, no, no, no need to ask forgiveness. It's just in those days, the Buddha didn't stand out. If you got to see and know there's some special qualities there, but even a monk didn't know he was spending the night with the Buddha. Anyway, so who is the Buddha? As sometimes I have a bit of fun too. I'm kind of, kind of well known, but not always. I remember just teaching at a conference in, uh, over in Vietnam. When I was teaching at a conference, it was in North Vietnam, in Hanoi. We were teaching at a conference there. And uh, when you're in a conference, you don't give every talk. So give me a chance to listen to other people teach the Dhamma, some really good teachers. So I was uh, on one other um, session, which was being taught. I sat in the back. And as I was sitting in the back, I think you can understand this, many of the the Vietnamese monks, they took the opportunity to learn some English by sitting next to me and engaging me in a conversation. It's the only way, way they can actually learn some English. So one sat next to me and said, no, who are you? And I didn't say that first of all. They said, no, where are you from? And I said, I am from Australia. And they said, oh, from Australia. Do you know a monk called Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> and I said, yes, I know him very well. <laughs> I'm being honest. <laughs> and they, they said something like, how well? And I said, I am Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> ah! <laughs> he shows some shock. I was only having fun, not being proud. But it was really good fun. So. <laughs> Anyhow, because sometimes people feel, if you've, got, <laughs> if you've got a good PA, and I think even in Sri Lanka I've got a good PA now, it doesn't always go according to the way you want it to go. So, anyhow, back to the, um, uh, what I was supposed to be talking about, non-self and responsibility. The deepest questions on that, if there is no one in here, does that mean I can do whatever I want? and just get away with all sorts of um, bad behavior, 
because I take no responsibility for it. Does the law of karma not work for me? Is that true? You know, one fascinating uh, thing which you learn when you meditate a lot, now there isn't anybody in here, but nevertheless, how, come you, how can you teach? Who gives the talk? Many years ago, that I was giving, one of the first times I gave a big talk over in Singapore, it was the Suntec City Convention Center, 5,000 people, not a conference, just all these people had just come to listen to myself. No sort of B act, no sort of supporting uh, talk, just a big chair on the stage, and I had to talk to 5,000 people, give them the Dhamma talk with questions and answers afterwards. First time I'd ever done that. And in Singapore, it's not just during a holiday time like the weekend. All the people there had delayed their dinner, taken time off, and just come and sat down to listen to me. And that really sort of made me a bit concerned. First time I'd ever given a big talk. And first of all, should I really do this? This is dangerous. If I give a bad talk, all those people who come here would have realized they've wasted their time, gone without a meal. They're so, so busy in Singapore. And also, I feel terrible that I respect Buddhism so much and the Dhamma's been so helpful. It was kind of you feel you would let people down. But then again, even worse, if I gave a really good talk, the danger of pride and conceit is very, very strong. So how can you deal with giving a big talk to so many people? If it's a good talk, I think that's really dangerous. Can I handle that? If it's a bad talk, I'd feel so guilty. The responsibility. But then a great insight happened as I was walking to the stage. The insight was, I'm not giving this talk. I spoke. It was a wonderful talk, it's recorded. But I never gave it. And I realized who was giving the talk? It wasn't Ajahn Brahm. It was, all, it was mostly Ajahn Chah, my teacher. March was from the Lord Buddha. And all the other teachers and people I'd associated with in all the years I'd been a monk, they were the ones who conditioned me who put all these wonderful ways of looking at the world and life, new ways. They were the ones who were giving the talk, my teachers. And it was a wonderful way of looking at you know, the talks who were given. And every now and again, it was strange. As I was giving talks, and I've given talks over all these years, sometimes, I say something, no, none of these talks is planned. I say something and I get impressed. I said, where did that come from? I never said that before. Now one of those uh, examples of something I never said before, but a very beautiful teaching, that was the one of the, the mango orchard simile. The mango orchard simile it actually came from Ajahn Chah, but I'd forgotten it for years. That simile is, he said, that the monastery is like a mango orchard. And in that mango orchard, all the trees have been planted by the Buddha. And straight away, being a scientist, I say, that's impossible. That was two and a half thousand years ago. You don't have mango trees lasting, any tree lasting, well, maybe the Bodhi tree, but mango trees, no. And then he said that each one of those mango trees have got so many delicious ripe mangoes. Do you like mangoes? I love mangoes. These were planted by the Buddha. And he said the trouble is, even though they're ripe and so sweet and juicy, it's very difficult to get those mangoes. 
if the wind blows or there's a storm, like the storm which was uh, here in UK recently, <coughs> the mangoes don't fall. If you throw a stick up to get the mango to, to fall, you'd always miss. If you get a ladder, the ladder will never reach. If you get a cherry picker, that will never be able to reach the mangoes. If you climb up the tree, you can't reach the mangoes. If you shake the tree, the mangoes won't fall. He said, the only way to get one of the sweetest and juiciest mangoes you'll ever be able to eat, the only way is to sit perfectly still under that mango tree. Sit perfectly still, hold out your hand, and a mango will fall into it straight away. I thought, what rubbish that was. That can't be true. Have you ever tried that? Of course you haven't. You never sat still enough. You have to be perfectly still, not moving at all. And hold out your hand it was like the kindness and compassion. You open up things, let them come to you. You open up your hand and a mango will fall right in. Now the fruits. How many of you want to be a so what? Do you want to know how to be a stream winner? Of course you do. I know that because you keep asking me. <laughs> and how does that happen? You've got to learn how to sit perfectly still first. Then hold out your hand. And those fruits will fall into your hand. So easy. Once you know how to be still. Not concentrated, that comes from a sense of self. It's something you do. How to be still. I'm sure you've all seen this one before, hopefully. The water here, Matthias, are you honest? No. <laughs> <laughs> so is this water still? Why? I'm not being mindful. So I'm now going to be mindful. I'm going to look at this water instead of looking somewhere else. Has it stopped moving yet? No. Okay, now I'll concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> it's worse. Have you ever known that when you want stillness in your mind, you're mindful and you concentrate, but it doesn't work? How many of you have difficulty meditating? Why? You're mindful and you're concentrating, it never gets still. But you know, Mattis, you've seen me do this before. How does this water get perfectly still? You let it go. Have you ever heard those words before, let it go? Don't attach, give up, abandon. Abandoned striving. Now, how still is that? It's perfectly still. You don't get any of the fruits by throwing sticks up at them. Or even if you get a helicopter, you won't be able to reach those fruits. You'll sit perfectly still. Let go, open up your hand, and a mango falls right in. So that simile, well, I remember giving one talk years ago, and that simile came up again. And I realized straight away that the Buddha taught me that. Well, actually, that Ajahn Chah taught me that. That's where it came from. And so a lot of times I know it's a truth. I don't give any talks. It's what people told me. You understand it. You actually just put a few extra words in there. And that's actually who teaches. It's one of the reasons why one of the... Sometimes people think these are simple teachings. They're not they're incredibly profound and complex. Even in the Mahamangala Sutta, Asewanaja Balana, Padita Naja Sewana. Avoid fools and you know, stay as much as you can with wise people. It's a great blessing. Yeah, you think. 
but you don't realize how powerful that is. One of the other reasons to become a stream winner is associating with other stream winners, with other Aryans. If you don't, then you find your, even your views get distorted. What you think is correct is not correct. But if you go with some really wise people, even though you may not believe it, you think that's rubbish, like I thought Ajahn Chah was wrong. That stays with you like a seed. And when your stillness grows and grows and grows, you see it for yourself. And you think, this is not my wisdom. This is wisdom which has been conditioned into you by the words of another, Paratagosa. And that's the only way it works. The stillness, which is the deep meditations. And don't ever think you cannot experience those deep meditations. <clears throat> Even in this previous range retreat, a few more people yeah. told me their experiences. At first, you, know, you don't take it on board straight away. You talk to them. And, you know, one of the things, if you have had one of those deep meditations, you also lose the sense of um, discontent. Arati disappears. And, and also tandi, which is weariness. You get a huge source of energy from deep meditation. But the one which I really like to test people on is their discontent a few times when people get deep meditation, I tell them, I'm terribly sorry, but you know, uh, Indonesian women can't get deep meditation. It's impossible. And there's an Indonesian woman who's just been on my retreat. And I just see what her reaction is. Well, let's make it, any Indonesians here? Okay, let's make it more interesting. Any Polish men cannot get into deep meditation. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess who you were. <laughs> and to see how, if they get really upset at me, they say, Adjo Bum, I'm never going to follow you ever again. What's wrong with Polish men? That's really unfair. <laughs> Same with Polish women, they can't get jhanas either. <laughs> You know me, so I'm just testing you out. Of course they can. <laughs> we just do that to see if you get a response back. If you get a response back, that means that that wasn't a deep meditation after all. It also gives me the opportunity to tell jokes which might be a bit challenging. Once upon a time, yeah, I, I, you can't stop me. Oh, no. <laughs> oh dear, what's the problem? There was a, this old tale of the, uh, the bear and the rabbit chasing each other in the forest. You know that story? The bear and the rabbit. And they were making so much noise that when they passed by the lake where the magic duck lived, it was magic duck, the magic duck shouted out of them, squawked to them, and said, look, this is a nice quiet forest. You're making so much noise, please be quiet. And the magic duck said, if you're both quiet and promise not to chase each other, I will give you three wishes each. And the, the bear looked at the rabbit, the rabbit looked at the bear and they agreed. They're only chasing each other because of boredom. And so, okay, we agree. So the bear said, my first wish, he was a male bear. Okay, please excuse me, but some males are like this. Said, my wish is that all the other bears in the forest are all female, I'm, I'm the only male. No, sorry, I got the wrong way around, didn't I? All the other bears, that's right, all the other bears in this forest are female. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm the only male. I said, look, that's a really... Selfish thought. I said, but you asked me for, for a wish. That's my wish, so grant it. So the magic duck went quack. 
And all the other bears in the forest were female. He was the only male. He was very happy. And then they asked the, the rabbit, what's your first wish? He said, my first wish, I want a motorbike helmet. <laughs> what do you want a motorcycle helmet for? He said, it's none of your business. You asked me to <laughs> present a wish, that's my wish. So the, the duck went quack, and a, a big Harley Davidson motorbike helmet appeared on his head. And there was a couple of holes there for the rabbit's ears. <laughs> and then they asked, okay, what's your second wish, Mr. Bear? And Mr. Bear said, my second wish, I should have said this first of all, when all the other bears in the country realize there's only female bears here, they will come and migrate here, they move here, and they spoil my fun. May all the bears in the whole country all be female, and I'm the only male in the whole country. Okay, quack, said the duck, and all the bears in the whole country were female except for him. Then they asked the, <laughs> the rabbit, what's your second wish? He said, I want a Harley, a Harley Davidson 1000cc motorbike to go with my helmet. Well, that's fair enough. And they're all sort of filled up with petrol, ready to go. Fair enough. Quack! And this rabbit was sitting on this big motorbike with his helmet, revving it up. Vroom, vroom, vroom. And then, <laughs> then they asked the bear, what's your third and final wish? And he said, my third and final wish, when all the bears in other parts of the world find out there's only female bears here, they will all find some way of coming here, migrating and spoiling my fun. Look, I should have said this first, but I'm a bit of a slow bear. When? So I want all the bears in the whole world, every bear in the world except for me. I want all those bears to be female, so I'm the only male bear in the whole planet Earth. Quack, and that became the truth. And then they, okay, Mr. Rabbit, what's your third wish? And Mr. Rabbit was revving up to make a fast getaway. My third wish is that Mr. Bear is gay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was karmically justified for that. <laughs> <laughs> And if anybody is offended by that, it means you haven't got a deep meditation recently. <laughs> <laughs> Just testing you out. <laughs> but, but anyway, you can actually see when you tell funny stories like that, which they have a meaning and they're relevant to the talk, people listening to, listen to them and they remember them, even the kids remember them, and that really helps them later on in their life. But anyway, so the responsibility. It's not personal responsibility I take for giving these talks. It's all the people who influenced me over those years and basically brainwashed me. And brainwashed me cleaning up from all your defilements. So you see things in a different way. It's not what I do. There's one other similar which came to me years and years ago way before it came to, to Google, the driverless bus. Because <clears throat> I imagined, imagined like a simile for life, like you're in a journey, that's an old simile, being on a journey, in a bus, in your vehicle. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you have a lot of wisdom, a lot of understanding, but your bus driver, your will, your choice, never does what it should do. You have like a good chaitana, a will, but a lot of times, I compare the will to be the one actually driving your bus, a lot of time your will is misinformed, or rather it just doesn't know how to drive the bus. I don't know how many of you have been through some very difficult times in your life, maybe cancers, losing a lot of money or other sort of very hard things to bear with. You tell your bus driver, 
Put your feet down hard on the accelerator. Get out of here. This is very painful. You want all the negative experiences of your life to get past as soon as possible. And then your stupid bus driver always tends to, to park, or at least go down slow when you have to do suffering in life. So why do I have to suffer so much? Why is life so hard? I tell my bus driver to drive out of here, but he doesn't. And other times in your life, having a wonderful time, nice and peaceful, nice and happy, things are going well for you in life. It's like you're going through some pleasant scenery in your bus. You tell the bus driver, slow down, park. You want to enjoy the nice times of life as long as you can. What did your bus driver do? Speed up. Speed up, yes. Your happy times go so fast, too fast, you realize you've got a stupid bus driver. So you, you want to find that bus driver and teach him how to, to drive a bus, how to let go of the pain, but just keep some of the happy times a bit longer. Make sure you learn strategies so your happiness lasts longer and your disappointment or pain goes more soon. That's what a lot of people expect from monks like me teaching. We go much further than that. Because after a while, if you're going to instruct you know, this will, this choice inside of you. Do you know who it is makes all these choices? You know why it sometimes makes stupid choices? Why, sometimes it makes wise choices. So you find out where that bus driver is sitting inside of you. Who is this thing which does all the choices? That part of yourself which decides which way you're going to go. And then that's what meditation does. You go so deeply into your mind. It's like you get up from your seat and you go to the, the driver's seat in the front of the bus. And when you get to the front of the bus, that's when you get one of the most amazing insights of your life. The bus driver's seat is empty. It's on autopilot. It's already been programmed in there, which way you're going to drive. Once you see that, that even the, the choice is an essential part of anatta, non-self, what does that do? What happens afterwards is you go back to your seat and sit down and shut up. It's a waste of time criticizing that bus driver. It's a waste of time praising that dri bus driver. You sit down in the seat and be quiet. There's no one there to shout to. Do you complain of people? Do you complain of your partner? Do you complain about yourself? Do you, honestly? Why? Who are you complaining to? Imagine your boss at work. You look at him, there's no one there. Who are you complaining to? Do you complain about me? You better not, otherwise you'll be in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> when I go to, to bed at night, do I think that was a terrible talk I gave? Or was a good talk I gave? I don't, because I didn't give it. My mouth opened. But all the words which came out, they were like seeded in me for a long time ago by my teachers, even seeded by the Buddha. All those sutras I read in Pali, when I decided that, for me anyway, the best way to hear this Dhamma is actually hear it or read it in Pali, because that's the language the Buddha spoke, and they were authentic. You know, they became so much more powerful. And so listening and reading them, that's where these talks come from. Not from me. And that's being honest with you. When you see that your choice does not come from you, but it's conditioned into you, and your wisdom was to allow 
good teachers to be able to teach you good things. That makes it much easier for you to do and speak good things. Simple things. You know that sometimes I know how long people have been married by how they speak to one another. There's so much more negativity the longer you've been together. And how can you help that? How can you save marriages? Not by going to a marriage counsellor, a lot of times by going to people who are calm, peaceful and wise. Just hanging out with them. Monks and nuns, good monks and nuns. That saves so many more marriages than any counsellor. You can just see the kindness, the softness, the forgiveness. You know, I've never met a perfect monk. Not even Ajahn Chah, he made mistakes. Perfect nun? No way. Good nun, yes. Good monk, yes, but not perfect. More than good enough to be a teacher. You don't have to be perfect to be able to live with somebody else. Sometimes these couples come to me and they say, well, what's the problem? And then the wife said, well, you, you don't know him. This is what he does. And then I asked her husband, yeah, what about your wife? Oh, no, she does this, she does that. And they point out all the faults in one another. <coughs> I'm surprised they ever got married in the first place. Because <laughs> those faults have been there all along. But when they tell me their faults, I say, you both got faults, you're both defective models. That's why you're such a good match. <laughs> In other words, taking it away, the idea of perfection. Well, can I tell another gross story to offend you? <laughs> okay. This monk in the time of the Buddha, would, actually I don't know if this was in the time of the Buddha, but this is what I heard, that his parents just allowed him to become a monk they really wanted him to disrobe and take on the family business. And so they said, look, you know, we're very wealthy. You still have to do the business, but we can get you a nice house and a nice you know, place to live and even get you a nice wife. In those days, they could do arranged marriages. And so he said, well, if you can find me a girl who fills all of my uh, desires and categories, then OK. So he told his mum and dad, that what type of girl he would like to marry. And in the end, his parents said, well, he doesn't you know, look like this, and be a good cook, and be intelligent, and be respectful. They could get a girl to fill all those qualities. But there was one problem in the very end. The parents couldn't find a girl to fulfill this quality. He said, I, I could offend you. I want a girl who doesn't fart, <laughs> doesn't pass wind. Is there any girl who never passes wind? Is there any monk who doesn't pass wind? Is there any of you, men, who never pass wind? None of you are perfect. See, one might be, one, you can always find something which is not perfect. What was a similar story? Did I offend you? Oh dear. Okay, I'll try harder. <laughs> there was another guy who just wanted to get married. He know he's got a good education, got a good job, enough money, so he wanted to find a really nice girl to marry. So he went went to Colombo and found one of the most beautiful Sri Lankan girls you could imagine. And he went out with her for a little while, and then uh, he found out that she couldn't cook. She was hopeless in the kitchen. And he said, well, I can't marry you because I can't cook either. I depend upon you to do all the cooking. So he realised that that girl was not good enough for him. 
So then, afterwards, he came to London. And there he found a beautiful girl, even more beautiful than the one before. And she was such a good cook that she had three restaurants she was running. And they were very, very popular. So he went out with her, but then he decided he couldn't marry her either. Because all she ever talked about was food. She had no intelligence. And didn't know anything else about anything else. So he gave up on her. So in the end, he should have done this first of all. He went to this town called Perth in Western Australia. <laughs> and there he found the most beautiful girl he'd ever imagined. Like more beautiful than any supermodel. And she had five restaurants, all with Michelin stars. And she was so intelligent. She had three PhDs, one from Oxford, one from Cambridge, and one from Harvard. <laughs> she was so intelligent and so beautiful and such a good cook, but he found he couldn't marry her either. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't marry her either. You know why? Because she was looking for the perfect man. <laughs> So just take what you can get. I think that was a signal there for me to be responsible and finish the talk. <laughs> okay, so, um, actually I was talking for an hour. Amazing, without falling asleep. And I saw a lot of you fell asleep as well, which is even more amazing. So now we always have the opportunity for questions and answers. This is how you can be responsible, you know, know what responsibility is. There is no self. You see that there's nothing which is actually doing things, it's conditioning. Then the only thing you're really responsible for is please associate with wise and good people. And all of these things, you may think you're not really paying much attention, but it actually gets inside of you, even the children as well. It's amazing just how much the kids understand goes inside of them. And they become surprises to their parents. Sometimes they tell you off, that's not how you should behave. It's wonderful to be able to do that. So anyway, your questions. Who's going to ask a question? Oh, yes. Well, Bhante, does uh, Ajahn Chah talk about some of the Vipassana at separate meditations? Ajahn Chah, I remember I was with him for nine years. And when people asked him that question, so what's Samatha Vipassana? Are they the same or are they different? He didn't have many visual aids, but he had his hand. He'd hold up his hand like this and say, can you see the front of my hand? Can you see the front? Yeah, the front is there, but the back's always there as well. Now you can see both, the front and the back. So this is like Samatha and Vipassana. Samatha's at the front. In this, or we pass this in the front, but the other side is just behind it, can't split them up. Now they're together. He said, Samatha we pass now are a pair. You can't split them up. But I'd like to extend that. Once upon a time, there was this couple, Sam and Vi. Sam's full name was Sam Atta. And Vi's name was Vipassana. And they lived together and one day they decided to go up on a nice walk on a sunny afternoon like today. Up a walk up Meditation Mountain. Sam went up there because it was so peaceful up Meditation Mountain. Vi, she was this nature photographer so she took one of these amazing cameras, this big Canon camera with all sorts of different filters on the front. Very expensive, but she wanted to get some big shots of the truth inside. But they didn't just go by themselves. They had pets. They had Meta, the dog. And they had uh, Anapana, the cat. <laughs> Is that okay, Anapana? It's got to be fair to cats and dogs. So they went up Meditation Mountain you know, together with uh, 
met the dog and Anapana the cat. And the, the more they um, climbed up Meditation Mountain, just the more peaceful it was. And even though that um, uh, the wife by Pasana wanted to save much of the, the f photographs when she got to the top, it was irresistible. Even halfway up Meditation Mountain, got some amazing insights. She was clicking and keeping them all. And Meta, the dog, she was getting more and more happy. You know when dogs are happy, they start wagging their tail? This little dog was wagging its tail so much. And as for Annapana, the cat, you know, Annapana said, oh, you know, cats sometimes, they disappear, they kind of vanish. You don't know where they are. They can hide. They come back again when it's lunchtime. As the cat said, I'm on, she used to do that. But Annapada <laughs> got more and more invisible. And then, when they got to the top of Meditation Mountain, Sam was just so happy. It was so incredibly peaceful there. But Sam had a pair of eyes, you could see the amazing insights from the top of Meditation Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like being playful. Uh, meditation Mountain and Vi. Oh, she had such amazing uh, views of everything. It was incredibly beautiful and so full of insights and wisdom. She was making some amazing shots. And Meta the dog was running around in circles, couldn't be so happy. But the the dog would also sit down, experience incredible peace and the amazing insights. And a partner, the breath had gone now, disappeared, as it should do. Because and a partner, the breath meditation, every other type of meditation is a vehicle. It can take you so far. And after the breath has been used, it gets so soft it disappears. Then the mind starts to get strong. These beautiful lights in the mind, they take you so far and they disappear. And then you get the bliss, the joys of the jhanas. They take you further. So the breath is not always there. It's not supposed to be there in deep meditation. How many of you are wearing your shoes here? You take them off, your shoes take you so far. You leave them at the front of the temple, then you come in here barefoot. It doesn't mean you don't use shoes anymore, you use the shoes for the right purposes. And then you leave them alone. Little things in meditation disappear one by one. When they're not needed anymore, you go to a more refined vehicle. So please don't think in meditation, I can't find my breath anymore. I'm doing meditation wrong. It is correct to actually let the breath disappear and let other meditation objects like nimitism and bliss take over. That is the way of meditation. And I made a, a point because too many people think, oh, I've lost the breath, I've got to go back. No, you're going well, carry on. So that's Sam, Atta, Sam, Vipassana, Metta and Anapana all going together, one disappearing first. And I do mention that because Metta is important, the kindness is important. Without it, deep meditation doesn't happen. Anyway, did that kind of answer your question at length. You know how the Buddha described it? Those are the two messengers. You can't separate them. Both are needed. If you don't know the two messengers simile, that was when a big emperor had a son and wanted to make sure the son could learn how to run the empire later on in life. So he assigned him to be king of one of the bordering uh, regions, had full authority to make mistakes. And after about six months, the headman came to see the emperor and say, your son is just parting all the time. 
first time away from home, he's enjoying himself and he's not really doing any of the, the governance of that area. So the emperor sent one of his wisest ministers to come and teach his son now how to balance his enjoyment in life also together with governance. And a wise minister went there and said, I've come from your father, the emperor. I don't care who you come from. Get out of here, said the, uh, the emperor's son, the king of this uh, little province. But I come from your king. Get out. I'm the boss here. The king especially said, I have full power over this region. So the, uh, the wise minister had to go back. When he come, went back, the emperor said, oh yeah, of course, it's my fault. I shouldn't have sent you alone. So next time he sent the wise minister together with one of the fiercest generals. And then when the wise minister returned, the king said, you again, get out of here. And at that, the fierce general took out his sword, held it to the king's throat and said, you better listen to this wise minister. I don't care who you are. I'll cut off, cut off your head. And it's amazing, at that point, when the king was perfectly still, he had to be, he had a sword to his throat. And then he paid full attention to the wise words of the minister and realized his mistakes. And from that time on, he became a good little king, and eventually the emperor who knew how to balance his own enjoyment and his service to his people without being corrupt. And the Buddha said, that wise minister was called Vipassana. And that fierce general was called Samatha. And if you don't have the two there together, it never works. You may have the insights, but not the stillness to be able to see them properly. Go on. So, in a sense we could say... Oh, oh. In a sense, we could say, oh, sense, yes, <laughs> certainly, I agree with you. <laughs> in a sense, we can say that our only responsibility or a major responsibility we have is to associate with the wise. Um, but isn't that also conditioned? You know, whether we associate with wise or not is conditioned too. By what we've read or yeah. who we've associated with before. So is there kind of no... Well, the question is... No, the answer is to all the people here. So you've all associated with the wise already, but you need to associate more with the wise. But, but who decides to associate with the wise? I do. <laughs> I brainwashed you a long time ago. <laughs> then who brainwashed me? Ajahn Chah brainwashed me. Who brainwashed Ajahn Chah, his teacher? Who brainwashed, who was the first person to brainwash all of these? The Buddha. Who brainwashed the Buddha? The Buddha Kasapa, the previous Buddha, the Gatikara Sutta, where the Buddha was a monk. Our Buddha was a monk under the previous Buddha. That's in the suttas. So even Siddhartha Gautama was already brainwashed by another Buddha. Who brainwashed Buddha Kasapa? Buddhas before him. So is it just chance if we meet the Buddha? Is it just karma? Is that like saying karma kind of explains everything? No, you can't say it explains everything. You can't say it doesn't explain everything. Usually this time I say, well, it's getting a bit late now. <laughs> <laughs> so even the Buddha said there are some things which are, are unexplainable. And they're not, use, they're not needed to be explainable. Because the main thing is to know that each one of you has been brainwashed. I love the word brainwashed rather conditioned. It, ma it makes it just a little bit less uh, intellectual and just much more emotional, much more powerful, I think anyway. That's why after a while when you start to get insights, or deep meditation, you have incredible gratitude to your teachers. I mean, real gratitude. 
when there was some years ago, there was a monk. He was a, a quite a, a big teacher over in um, Thailand, and he came up to me one day without explaining or asking permission, and just grabbed my feet and started kissing them. It was really weird and very dangerous in Thailand. You don't know what you might catch. Over here, no one would ever do that. You might catch COVID. I don't know, all these other monkeypox or all sorts of other stuff. It's a silly thing to do. But anyway, he did that and I said, why? What are you doing it? Get off. And then he explained why. Because I was one of the first people to teach him meditation. And he loved the instruction so much. That meant so much to him. He just wanted to show appreciation. He was American as well. That just really... But then I thought, my goodness, if Ajahn Chah was around, I'd probably grab his feet too and just slob them all over them. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do people do that? It's gratitude. We get so amazingly big. Maybe you're not doing it appropriately, but that's what happens. Yeah, over there, yes. I get confused because sometimes desires come, yeah. and I'm aware that they're conditioned, and I know that trying to resist it is bad, but also we shouldn't have desires, so I don't know how to... You don't resist them, you just let them go. You put them down. You don't stop them, that's just too negative. There's too much effort. They will win. You have this other beautiful way of stopping desires. And there was this girl over in Perth who told me this story. That she had a six-year-old son. They were just at home together one day and her son had a tantrum. Mummy, I don't love you anymore. I'm leaving home at six. What would you do if you were that mother? This was an incredibly wise mum. She said, good idea, I'll help you pack. <laughs> and that's what they did. They went to the kids' bedroom, they packed a suitcase with really important things in life, like teddy bears and Spider-Man suits. And then, <laughs> and then she told her son, your know, life is a very long journey, you need something to eat. So she made his favourite sandwiches, put them in a brown paper bag and gave to her son and kissed him off at the front door of the house. Have a lovely time, son. Only six years of age. And so the son said, yes, yeah, see you, Mum. And then went to the end of the garden path, opened the gate, turned down the road and walked into his own life for the first time. Got about another hundred metres and I'm terribly homesick. Turned around and went back opened the garden gate, down the garden path, and Mum was still waiting there. Welcome home, darling. She was such a kind, good mum, by letting her son go. The son never had any reason to leave home. Went back, straight away. This is like your mind, desires. You try to stop the desires, you're feeding them. They get stronger and stronger. Instead, understand your desires, and after a while, just there's no point to them. You all know that Mara in Buddhism, how did the Buddha defeat Mara? Not by punching him or kicking ass, as they say in the United States, kicking butt. Understood Mara. Then Mara would always disappear, say, the monk, the nun, the meditator knows me. That's how Ma will be defeated every time. Desires, that's how they're defeated. Knowing them, not suppressing them, understanding them. They've got no power over you anymore. Okay, one there and one at the back, one over there. There's quite a few now. Okay, okay, go. Thank you. Um, my question is, 
question is how to practice practice meditation with children because back in australia children can go to sunday school and they practice they have more more chance to practice but um in the uk we can't find any sunday schools for children they um, teach in english and uh, we realize it's quite difficult to practice at home especially as the children to be quiet uh for for 20 or 30 minutes any they have sunday school here in english here they have a Sunday school in English. Okay, it's one place. Sing, sing both. Sing at the same time? No, different times. Oh, different times. Okay, different times. But at the same time, there was this mum, I really respect her, that she had kids about your age. And she would sit in meditation. Every time she sat in meditation, the kids would climb over her, pull her hair, and it always was disturbing her. And then one day she decided, no, I'm going to meditate. She sat down, and even though her kids started pulling her hair, saying, Mummy, Mummy, I need to go to the toilet. Mummy, Mummy, someone's at the door. Mummy, Mummy. She sat there, <laughs> ignored everything. And it's amazing just how the kids, how wise they are, or how sneaky they are, whichever way you call it. Mummy, Mummy, Jenny's turned on the gas. Mummy, Mummy, Mary has got a big knife out from the kitchen. <laughs> her mother said, she said to herself, even if they cut themselves up and blow up the whole house, I'm going to meditate no matter what. So she just, she just sat there. And from that day on, when she opened up her eyes, they hadn't cut each other up, there's no blood on the floor. And the gas, you know, hadn't blown up the whole house. They never, hadn't even turned it on. It was like threats. Mother resisted those threats. And the kids were just playing quietly in the corner. And to this day, whenever she wants to meditate, she just sits down on a cushion and meditates at home. And the kids actually respect that. Play quietly in the corner. Because you know that mummy is a much nicer mummy after she's relaxed in meditation. Do you understand that, your kids? Is that true? The kids? It's not maybe, it is a truth. She's much, much nicer if she's meditated. Okay, next question. Okay, yes, There's one over here. Girl, boy, girl, boy, you have to keep it fair. Over here. Yeah, sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay, okay. See, I, I haven't sort of conditioned very much to be enough. Yes? When, when I jump, oh, no. It's not on. Um, <coughs> yes. Can you always say the question, I'll repeat it for you. Hang on, hang on. What's the question? As a lay person, I know I still haven't um, got rid of many of my attachments. I'm still attached to many, many things. But what I detach is from my thoughts most of the time. Um, so there's this vast gap where you can identify your thinking and your not thinking. Yes. And I feel like I'm holding on to things, but with awareness. Yes, but after a while, when you get very silent, that's what happens when you stop thinking. Really silent, it's like a stillness of the mind. And they always have this beautiful simile, the best way to see the full moon is reflected in a still forest lake. Then the moon is not distorted by any waves or ripples on that water. If you really are without thought and silent and perfectly aware, the awareness increases. And many of the attachments which you had before, I think, why have got those? You can let them go. But actually you don't let them go, they just disappear. They're just not there anymore. It's like, you know, when you were young, what was your favorite toy? Did you have a little doll? Have you still got it? When, you, when, you, when did you decide to detach from it? 
It just after a while, you can't remember the time. It wasn't a decision you made. Just it was not important for you anymore. Just like monks and money. After a time, you know, money was really important to me when I was young. Now as a monk, what do you want money for? Even like donations to Bodhinyana Monastery. Every time we get more donations to Bodhinyana Monastery, I think, oh my goodness, now we've got to do another project to use this money. If you don't have any money, you don't need any projects. I know that Damasara, not Damasara, Anu Kampa Bikuni project still hasn't got real temple yet. So they say they can use money, but there come a time when you don't want any money anymore. So you give it to another, another sort of temple. How big can you make a temple? It's just too much work looking after it. And I think many of you have seen where I live. Have you seen my mansion in which I live? It's a cave. A little monk made cave, maybe two and a half meters a diameter. I can just stretch out in it. Three meters? Three. It's a nice cave with rocks. I never need to paint it. I never need to actually clean it. Other monks do that. It's very fast to clean. And I really recommend you to, it's a great place to live in caves. You don't need air con, you don't need heaters. Keeps a constant temperature. And it's bushfire proof. <laughs> so I can stay in there. And look, the, the other officers in the bushfire brigade don't need to worry about me at all. It's true, inside the caves, the fire can't get to you. So that's, you can simplify life. As you simplify life, you realize all you're really holding on to is like heavy weights which just weigh you down. One of those meditations was regarding the past as a big, heavy suitcase, really heavy, and you've been carrying it around for way too long. And in your right hand, another heavy suitcase. It makes it very hard to proceed through life. And you realize in the first suitcase, it's got these four letters written on it, past. The second suitcase has got F-U-T-U-R-E written on it, it's the future. Can you imagine just slowing those two suitcases down? Imagine if you let go of all your past, just for a few minutes, let go of all the future. You find you don't want to pick them up anymore. You experiment first of all. You feel the beauty of being silent, being blissed out, you're going to carry no weights, not thinking, to the time being not attached to anything in the world. How beautiful and blissful is that? And that shows you what it's like. You get a taste of it first of all, and then you make that real and permanent. Or long lasting. That's how you let go of things. If there was something useful, then be attached to it. If it's not useful, then don't. I always say that sometimes Buddhists are a bit stupid. They say you shouldn't be attached to anything. I say no, always be attached to the to the back seat of a motorbike when you're going through heavy traffic in Gore Road. Same as like people say always be positive. I say no. If you're having a COVID test, please be negative. But when you believe it's very difficult to be detached from your husband, your children, all you can have is that awareness, I feel. It's difficult but not impossible. How can you be detached from your husband and your children? How you can be detached from them is understand that they're human beings going their, their own way. You do your duties. You do your sense of right duty, responsibility, for your parents and children, but especially for your children. But there comes a time the mother has to let go. Your children will get hurt. When they get hurt, that's when they learn so much, when they grow. Protecting your children too much means they never get the sense of their own immunity. It's one of the things which I 
loved about growing up in London in the 50s and 60s, you go out and play soccer on the streets. You always be falling over and scraping the skin off your, your knees. I'd run cry to my mother and she would actually kiss them better. That's what she said. She would uh, kneel down and put a mouthful of germs and bacteria on this open wound. And never once did it get infected. And the pain went away straight away with the kindness. Now I think that's where you got a lot of immunity from. I never caught COVID at all. And I, actually, the, I am one of the healthiest monks in Bodhinyana Monastery. You're just there for three months. I haven't been in a hospital for years. I know now, so it was for, for 32 years. The last time I went to the hospital. That's really impossible. It's not that I isolate myself from others. I'm sitting in front of hundreds of people every evening. So if anyone should get something like COVID, it should be me. Should it? Even like stomach aches. There's more food that I eat, which I don't know where it came from. But still, you just have this beautiful way of immunity and understanding how to deal with problems in the body. I should be falling fast asleep now. I should have terrible jet lag. I hardly sleep much at all the last few days. Does it look like I've got jet lag? How come? Anyway, it's hard, but don't sort of be hard on yourself. You take it slowly. How old are your children? Oh, crikey, you should be able to let go of them now. <laughs> but if you have something which is beautiful to replace them by, like some Dhamma, some meditation, you really enjoy that. And after a while, this, why am I attached to anything? Be free. So I'm brainwashing you. You might not agree with me, but I'm sorry it's too late now. I've got it in your head. <laughs> Is there any quick question? Gentlemen over there, because the senior member of our Sri Lankan Buddhist Society. It is a very great pleasure and an honor to see you here in the Spiritual Temple of ours. And um, also, we very much appreciate your kindness in making it a point to come always during your, your tours in England, yes. always coming here and paying respects to our venerables here as well. Now, talking about Meditation, I just want to clarify just one point. If a meditator begins to see, as you say, the nimitta yes. or the counterpart object, yes. what stage has he reached? Well, the stage they reach is right next to jhanas. It's close, but that's one of the reasons why once you've gone further than the nimitta, see where it's going to lead. Feelings of um, fear disappear very easily because why are you being afraid and stopping some emotions? Much, much nicer coming afterwards. Many people I know, some people I'm very close to, had problems with fear just before a jhana would happen. It's like in this limited stage, immense bliss. And to go even further was letting go a bit too much for you. <coughs> Then after a while, you have to decide not to be afraid. And you say, this is blissful, I'm not going to be here. It's like your sense of self is vanishing for a while. Why not? Should it always be white? No, colours of limiters are not important. What is important is the intensity of it. Intensity. Yeah. So I've seen many different colours myself and some of the other people. 
what is really important is those nimittas. If it is white, it's like white you've never seen in the world. Like a blue, which is incredibly more blue than blue. There's a classic sign of a nimitta. It's like every one of those colors has been purified, burnished, the purest yellow you've ever seen. If anybody experiences those nimittas through sound, which is much rarer, the sound is like heavenly music, something you, you, you can't hear with your ears in this world. Those are typical so signs. Yeah, can I ask another question, which has been troubling me for a little while? Okay. Because there are a of us here, they always, when it comes to the Buddha, they say, Lord Buddha. Yes. I have been working for many years for a Lord in this country. Yes. And the, um, Mr. Gavin Barwell, he's the MP for Central Croydon, but he yes. lost his thing. He's now Lord. Gavin Barbell. Yes. Yeah. So is it all right to call Buddha? I have heard you say Yes, I say it sometimes. I say it here sometimes as Lord Buddha, sometimes as the Buddha. Yeah. It's difficult to find a word. The idea of a Lord, some Lords did some terrible things in the past. But some Lords, it's a term of respect these days. Yeah. And so we always want... Sorry? It's a bit Christian. It's Christian, yeah, but I don't know. Sometimes they say, good Lord. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> so I think it's more with the person who says it, what it means. But I know that some people complained about that when I said Lord in a place like Australia because they wanted, like, equity. So, you know, Lord is very male. Very sort of, uh, people usually become Lords because they're born into it instead of like a choir yeah. because of their hard work or their, um, uh, their wisdom. So I don't know, some people don't like lords, but I remember just one lord I went to see, he gave a political speech and that was like screaming Lord Such. <laughs> Many years ago he stood against, I think, uh, uh, the Premier, Prime Minister of England, Harold Wilson. And eventually, he would stand every year for election, but then eventually he, couldn't, he ran out of money. He couldn't afford the deposit for standing at a British election. And then many of the other candidates for that election, they clubbed together, they paid his deposit for him. I thought it was very British. You know, they actually paid for someone who was standing in the election against them. Because of a nice tradition. Is it respectful? Respectful, yes. But you know, even so sort of saying you know, Lord Buddha, it's not respectful enough as far as I'm concerned. But I could find another word which is even more respectful without being uh, without showing like some superior power, but just superior kindness and peace. The Sabbath we personal was superior, fine, but not power. It's a wonderful thing about Buddhism. What the Buddha said when he passed away, you know, who will take over as uh, you know, the chief Buddhist from now on? And he said, let the suttas and the vinaya, all I've teed, taught, may that be the leader from now on. And, and that was an amazing thing to say. It wasn't a person anymore. It's all those teachings which are there in the books which you could see. And the Dhamma Vinaya, that will be the teacher. That will be the Mahanayaka of the Mahanayakas from now on. You know where the Mahanayakas came from? That was my ancestors, the Brits. They made the Mahanayakas in order to control Buddhism in Sri Lanka. There was no Mahanayakas in the ancient days. No Sangharajas of Thailand. There's no, what do they call them in Burma? They don't really. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay, there's another question behind. And over in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Yeah. Um, 
Is it okay, is it okay we do some more questions? I know we're supposed to leave at nine o'clock. I'm just checking with the management for the okay. We just have one. Oh, you've got to go. Yeah, there's one in the back as well. So, but anyway, do your question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brett. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to know um, when you're working with people that are dying, uh, what sort of advice do you give them when they have very strong attachments and can't really let go into the process? Okay. First of all, give kindness. Give kindness to your attachments. Then they're much easier to let them go. Go the opposite way which you think. If you try to let go of the attachments, it's hard to let them go because you're giving them negativity. And it makes them stronger. Give this kindness. You can go if you want to. You don't have to. And then they find out that it's easy to let them go. Many people are rebellious especially old people when they're about to die. Who are you to tell me to let go of this? <coughs> you don't have to, you can if you wish. And a lot of times that kindness, they give it a try. There's this one lawyer, <clears throat> he was very, very wealthy. He was on his deathbed. And so he always was told you can't take it with you. He had lots of money, millions. So being a lawyer, and having nothing to do in bed all day, being sick and about to die, he started planning. There must be some loophole somewhere, some way I can get around this. I worked hard, made a lot of money all my life. Why can't I take it with me? He found out this brilliant way of taking it with him. He asked, he told his wife to go to the bank with the two biggest suitcases he could find and fill each suitcase What's the biggest banknote in, in Britain these days? Thousand pound note or? No, then a hundred. Fifty, okay. Okay, so he went to Singapore where he can get a thousand Singapore dollar note. <laughs> <laughs> and he packed it tight, told his wife to pack them in both suitcases, with millions in each suitcase. And then to put them above his bed in the attic just on either side of where he was laying down. So that when he died and went up to heaven, he could grab the two suitcases on the way and go to heaven. And his wife was too wise to argue with her husband who was a lawyer. So that's what she did. And he soon died. And after he had died, she did the funeral service for him and then checked in the attic. And those two suitcases were still there. And he said, stupid husband, he should have put those two suitcases in the room underneath his bed. <laughs> I know which way he was going. <laughs> okay, sorry about those silly jokes. But anyway, it's a wonderful question about death and dying. If any of you had the privilege to be with someone, when they're dying moments. The first thing as Buddhists to remind you, death is not a moment. It's a process which takes many minutes. So to say your last thought is actually wrong. It's your last thoughts over several minutes. And you can't really control those. It's like a summation of all you've done in your life so far. If you've been a peaceful, good person, that's what you remember. And that's how you will die. Good person. Shout it out very quickly because I'm supposed to be finished now. But the very, very, very last of the last. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, you can ask 11. I think the English cricket team has listened to your lectures quite a lot. <laughs> and from the world champion, they are now at the bottom of the pond street. Excellent. Yes. Uh, my question is. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, co uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, meditation. When you say mindfulness meditation, exactly what we what we are mindful of, and the reason I'm asking is that when I'm trying to meditate. I can listen, I can smell, I can 
sense with my, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can kill something. So, am I not supposed to be mindful of all these things, or am I supposed to channel my mind to certain things? No, the best, the best way with mindfulness meditation is to make sure that you are at the kindness, the kindfulness. If it really is kindfulness, so what you see, you see deeper into that. Whatever sound you hear, you can hear it more clearly. Even feelings in the body, you can actually see them. A lot of them don't hurt anymore. It's amazing what you can do just with kindness. And if you know what uh, this actually does, you understand what the mindfulness and kindness do. It's incredibly powerful. And then might the kindfulness to whatever's right in front of you right now. Make that the most important. Don't choose. Just be kind to it. And after a while, you become in this present moment when you become really still, the body will disappear. This is where the mind will go. They'll go into nimittas. They just come up when they're ready, not when you want them. And the kindfulness leads you really deep into meditation so easily. You do nothing. Whatever's in front of you right now, that's what you're aware of, with kindness. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yes, okay. Me to say something about it? One of the main reasons I've come here it's also for the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project. So it's nice to give it some support. And so if it does, if, if it all falls apart, I won't be coming to England anymore. <coughs> Honestly. So please look after the. We have, it's growing. We have more people want to come and stay there. We just were talking to them beforehand in the, the quarters over there. Really good people. Would you like to become, a, I have the opportunity, have the choice to become a bhikkhuni one day, if you wanted to. Why is it you've got no choice at the moment? Well, it's very hard. That's not good enough. Buddhism should be able to give the opportunity. It may not even be you, but maybe we your children in the future. So please, let's support the Anakampa Bhikkhuni Project. Let's make that a place of full ordination for bhikkhunis, for women, in England. I feel responsible for this. I was born in this country. <clears throat> and so you really want to make sure that this country has strong sangha, not just of men, but of women as well. I'm working my butt off all the time. Uh, I should be retired by now, 903. <laughs> or 72 and three months. Surely that's old enough to retire. But I won't until we get some equity. A lot of lay people really sort of admire that. I did, you do know that I was giving like, a, it's the same as the OBE. It's the Australian, what is it, Order of, the Order of Australia. Similar, but that's in Australia for giving equity. And all your females, gender equity. Sometimes you feel that Buddhism, yeah, it says about kindness and wisdom, but it's not. It doesn't treat you fairly. And that's just unacceptable. You have to do something about it. I've done a lot, I can still do some more. I'll ask you to help out as well. Okay, you want to? Sum up. Most venerable Mahasangha, dear Dharma friends, we all had a wonderful evening today. It was uh, very useful and very uh, valuable Dharma talk delivered by the most venerable uh, Ajahn Brown. Uh, Thank you very much, Bhante, for uh, visiting our temple and uh, giving a great uh, valuable Dharma talk. And uh, we wish you uh, good health and long life. Long life. <laughs> Blessings of Triple Gem be with you. And uh, may you have uh, all the 
good health, happiness, and at the end, may you attain supreme bliss of Nibbana. Thank you very much. Excellent. And also, I, I really thankful to our Mrs. Lushani Kodituakko and Sanjay Kodituakko and family because they have informed us uh, one day is coming to the UK and they told us to arrange the Dhamma talk. And thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, uh, coming to the our teams for this Vihara. Uh, we wish you all good health, happiness, and may you all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sare, sare, sare. Apivadana silis nicham vadda pachayinu Chattaro dhamma vaddanti Ayuvannu sukham balam Ayuraro gya sampatti Sag sampatti mevach Ato nibban sampatti ti iminate samijjatu sadhu sadhu sadhu